thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and uh, thank you all for coming uh, in this afternoon session. So uh, I was thinking about, first of all, uh, if I'm a little incoherent, because Amos' deadline was last night. Uh, some of us who wrote papers for Amos are probably in the same state. So there's a question about uh, what to present in the sense that there's a number of collaborators in the room who have seen this talk many times before. And if you choose to read your email, that's perfectly fine. But uh, I've decided to just give you a quick overview, focusing more on the applications since this is a workshop focused on game theory and practice. Um, so there's a large number of collaborators because it's going to be expand, uh, talking about the entire range of work on security games. Uh, in the room are uh, Vince, Thomas, Kevin, Albert, and hopefully I'm not forgetting somebody. Um, and we have lots and lots of collaborators and uh, lots of students and postdocs as a current team. All, uh, so given the large number of collaborators, I'll highlight the role of uh, key students and postdocs as we go through the presentation. So uh, let's start uh, with the basic uh, premise here. Security is a global concern. Uh, we have to protect our ports and airports, uh, interdict the illegal flow of drugs, weapons, and money, suppress urban crime, protect forest, fish, and wildlife. In all of these cases, uh, we have limited security resources and a large number of targets to protect, and a watchful adversary who can monitor our defenses and exploit any patterns. So the question becomes, how do you schedule or plan or allocate limited resources? And we appeal to game theory, in particular a model called uh, Stackelberg Security Games. Now, some of you are very familiar with this model, but for the benefit of those who may not be, I'm going to use a very small example and run through it very quickly. Uh, so this is a two-by-two two, uh, toy example of the U.S. Coast Guard trying to protect the port made up of two targets. And uh, in this case, target one happens to be more important than target two. Now we know that Coast Guard are out there first patrolling. If they commit to a pure strategy, always trying to protect one of the targets, the adversary can exploit that. However, if the Coast Guard were to commit to a mixed strategy, a randomized strategy, 60% of the time they're at target one, 40% of the time they're at target two, an adversary conducting surveillance will only know that the Coast Guard are here 60%, there 40%, but what they'll do tomorrow remains unpredictable. The goal here is only to increase the cost and uncertainty to attackers in coming up with a plan of attack. The point being that we are not guaranteeing 100% security because there is no such thing in the real world. We are optimizing the use of our limited resources. And these kinds of games are Stackelberg games because security forces come at first, they're out in the open, the adversaries conduct surveillance, and then they respond. And the challenge for us, I mean, in this case, it's a two by two game, 60-40. Uh, is it a 60-40 allocation? Should it be a 70-30 allocation? Of course, we can solve this by hand, but when it comes to trillions of possible patrolling strategies, large numbers of targets, solving these games by hand becomes difficult. And that's where our, our contributions have been in terms of solving massive scale games under uncertainty. So this was sort of the first set of applications we built that came out of this work were uh, all focused on infrastructure security. So uh, the US Coast Guard, for example, is using solutions to what we've done to generate patrols in ports like uh, Boston and New York and Los Angeles and Houston. Uh, so that's uh, you know, taking into account weights of targets in the port. Or the patrols around the Staten Island ferry are also generated using these uh, Stackelberg game models. With the TSA, our work was to assign air marshals to flights on a randomized basis, uh, taking into account risks of the flight. So this is again solved as a Stackelberg game model. I'll talk to you about how this, all work, how this work all started. This was at the LAX International Airport, um, setting up checkpoints and canine patrols at the airport on a randomized basis. Uh, the work has gone on. Argentina, Buenos Aires Airport uh, patrolling. We uh, take uh, our own medicine, so at USC, uh, assigning uh, Patrols, uh, this is all done in the same way. The LA Sheriff's Department, that's something that they have, uh, so these are all deployed. Uh, this is being tested and so forth. So this is uh, what we've done in the past, please. I just don't entirely understand the motivation for the Stackelberg solution okay. concept when it's a mixed strategy. I mean, so, I mean, if you're mixing over lots of possibilities, are you assuming somehow that the attackers know you're, they're, they're should be best responding to that? So, I mean, let me just proceed so I can, uh, you, can, you, can see, you can see what's uh, going on here, uh, just momentarily. And so um, where we are going next here is uh, with uh, green security. So this is uh, 
collaboration with uh, Panthera World Wildlife Fund, uh, non-governmental organizations for protection of wildlife, uh, endangered wildlife, or with the Coast Guard for protection of fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is a uh, collaboration with IBM to try to ensure that uh, we can do randomized inspections of factories that might be polluting rivers. Now what's new here is the fact that um, here we have unfortunately a lot of data because there's a lot of poaching attacks, a lot of illegal fishing going on. And as a result, we can learn adversary models from the data. And then we can improve our strategies and play again. So it becomes like a repeated game. What's also interesting here is that we can now bring in insights from conservation biology and criminology. And so we now have a uh, conference of C's, Computation, Conservation, and Criminology, that we've been holding uh, for the past two years. There's a domain where there is even more data than this, and that's uh, opportunistic crime. So we have data from in and around USC. Unfortunately, we are in part of LA where there's a lot of crime. And so for the past three, we have data, for example, for the past several years uh, that gives us uh, data uh, from, from this space that allows us to learn adversary models. So there's not, a, uh, fortunately, not a whole lot of data here. We start getting medium amounts of data here, and then uh, lots of data here. And so this leads to some very different research challenges, uh, challenges in exploration versus exploitation here, for example. Some of our colleagues have tried to push all of this into cybersecurity. Uh, that's not our work, but uh, that work does exist, and I'm not going to talk about it. So uh, USC did a nice uh, magazine article for on, on our work, pointing out uh, some of the deployments. Uh, it was nice to see some of these deployments spreading outside the US because of our partnerships with the NGOs. And all of this is possible because of us embedding with the different security agencies, uh, with the Coast Guard, so me, my students, postdocs, collaborators, working closely with these agencies trying to understand local constraints. In the process, our students uh, having to learn a whole new kind of cutting plane algorithms that they didn't think that they would have to learn in computer science. So more recently, with uh, all of this in 2000, uh, 12 or so, I competed in the USC competition to win startup funds, based on which I launched a startup, Armorway. There's a movement of panic right after launching when PhD students quit their jobs to join the startup. Uh, but uh, now they're running it, and it's doing very well. Uh, it's growing. And so it's a very exciting time in terms of uh, the security game's work and where it's going with it. So in the rest of this presentation, I'll start with the uh, Infrastructure security games, sort of giving you a quick overview, focusing mostly on the applications and just sort of telegraphing uh, key uh, technical challenges. And I'll come to your question as we move along. So, um, uh, all of the work has been published uh, in uh, AI conferences, AAAI, HKI, AMAS, and so forth. So, there's the standard evaluation that you'll see in those papers. But since we are fortunate that a lot of this work is deployed in the real world, there's also evaluation that we must do in the real world. And here, I really just ask for your patience. I will get to it uh, in the last 10 minutes, but I just need, need to go through the rest of the stuff before I get to the evaluation. So let's start with the first, which is uh, uh, LX, which was our first system called Armor. And this is the basic uh, Stackelberg security game model that we have. So uh, the, the problem started uh, with uh, Errol Southers, who was uh, assistant chief for airport police at the time, uh, being concerned about security at LAX. Uh, his concern was attack something like this, somebody uh, attacking the, this uh, Glasgow airport, attack somebody ramming a, a truck full of explosives or vehicle bomb ex improvised explosive device at the airport. Now, um, he talked to us about the extensive surveillance that happens uh, of, of these kinds of settings so that the adversaries get to know the security measures. Uh, he talked to us about maps, surveillance maps of Western airports being found on computers uh, confiscated in Pakistan uh, from terrorists. And so there's sort of this idea that uh, there's a lot of surveillance going on. And so based on this, uh, at the time, it just seemed like a good idea. 2006, Vince and Thomas had written this paper on Stackelberg Games. Uh, it's, Errol had asked us, you know, how do I schedule and plan and allocate? And so based on this, uh, Armor was launched. And so there's 18 bound roads into LAX, but uh, not enough officers to have checkpoints on all roads at all times. 
a terminals, not enough dogs to be at all terminals at all times. So where and when do you schedule checkpoints? Where and when do you do patrols? And so we do solve this problem using Stack Helper game models. Sometimes it uh, leads to arrests of a lot of people, as you see there. And so uh, the same, so we call this the basic game model because I'll keep enhancing it. The exact same model is in use in Buenos Aires Airport. This is work done by University of Buenos Aires, as I said, also at USC. And so how does this work? Uh, to begin with, uh, we take an uh, entire game matrix, we feed it into a mixed integer program. The mixed integer program provides us a probability distribution over uh, your strategy. So for example, it's saying, uh, do a K9 patrol at 8 a.m. at terminals 2, 5, and 6, K9 patrol at 8 a.m. at terminals 3, 5, and 7, with the different probabilities. And then we sample from this distribution to get an actual schedule that gets executed by the police officers. So this is the actual schedule that gets handed over to the officers. So it's saying at 8 a.m., send team one to terminal two, team five to term, uh, terminal three, uh, team five to terminal six, and so on. Please. Do you know the attacker's payoffs? Uh -oh. I was just going to talk to you in a minute. That's a very good question. Just one second. And so let me just uh, go through the mixed integer program, and I'll kind of quickly go through this. We are trying to maximize defender expected utility. Uh, Rij is the reward to the defender if the defender takes a strategy I and the adversary takes a strategy J. Xi is the probability with which we execute a particular strategy. Now here, we are enumerating every possible allocation of defender resources to target. So X1 is the probability that there's a dog on terminal one, dog on terminal two. X2 is the probability there's a dog on terminal two, a dog on terminal three. This works for small problems like LAX. It soon runs into trouble, as you'll shortly see. QJ is the adversary's best response. Now, um, so we can s solve this problem, but the question is exactly how do you know the attacker's payoffs? And so here uh, at LAX, the threat was somebody driving a truck bomb into one of the terminals. And so based on that, uh, the idea is uh, there's great data available on how many people are there at different times of the day at different terminals. And so we look at that as a measure of civilian casualties, and that becomes our payoff. Later on, I'm going to talk to you about an application we developed for the US Coast Guard. So there's a team or teams that have gone to every single major port in the United States for every single target that they could find, for every single method of attack that they could think of, they say how many people will die and what will be the economic consequences. Multiplying uh, life by a million dollars or some number of million dollars, you get a single number for each target. It's called the risk index number. And there's sort of lots and lots of this detailed data that's available, and that's what we are reading as our payoff matrix. Now, you understand that this is not perfect, so we have to handle uncertainty, and I'll come to that a little bit later on. But with all of this in place, uh, by 2008, Armour was at work at LAX. Given this and other enhancements uh, that Errol had made to the LAX airport, he gave a testimony before a congressional subcommittee hearing. And I'm going to play a small clip uh, from this testimony, as, uh, as shown here. LAX is safer today than it was 18 months ago. A team of research led by Dr. Malen Tambe worked with our department to develop Armour. <laughs> By the way, if uh, you don't know Errol, he was nominee number one, uh, Obama, uh, President Obama's nominee to head the TSA. This was the first uh, nominee. But we were very fortunate he declined and uh, stayed at USC. And so he's now a great friend. Um, and so, but around the same time, uh, Newsweek had this article, Armour Throws a Digital Cloak of Invisibility, which led my uh, colleagues at AMAS next year to ask me how our cloaking device research at USC was coming along. But this led um, uh, us to be contacted by the Federal Air Marshal Service, and their challenge is assigning air marshals to flights. Now, uh, Armour, 100 actions, IRIS, we're looking at certainly 1,000 th flights a day, assigning air marshals. With just 20 air marshals, the action space was 10 to the power 41. So just going back to the, sure. the Armour example, it, it, in your toy example at the very beginning, like the action space of the defender and the action space of the attacker were the same. Yeah, yeah. Here, I guess it's less obvious to me. It seems like the action space of the attacker would be something like, what point do I want to attack? The action space of the defender is, where do I station people for checkpoints, right? So, so it's not quite the same. But right, right. So the, the first, yeah, the first toy example, you know, there's only one resource. If you have two, then the defender action space starts to grow, because now you're looking at all possible combinations. Yeah, exactly. 
And so if you have 20 air marshals, let's say 1,000 flights, then you're looking at all possible assignment training. I guess what I was asking is, did you have to, in addition to designing the payoffs of the attackers, did you also have to just think about designing what the strategy space looks like, or how did you do that? Was it? Was that so in, in this case, uh, I mean, there's sort of a natural allocation for the defenders, for example, you know, which check, which roads are we going to set up checkpoints on? There are eight roads. So I don't know if that's the question you're asking, but let it... Was it the same? The, the strategy space of the attackers? Is... The attacker is just going to go attack one terminal, for example, in that so example. So their action space is more constrained. Right? right, right. And here, too, the action space of the attacker is more constrained. I'll come to an example where it's more complex just in a minute. Yeah, go on. Can you say a little bit more about how you choose which equal... I mean, is it unique to equal? Yes, yes, yeah. And it's also, not pure strategy, it's always mixed? Well, we are looking for it's it's well. I mean, you can have multiple, but it'll get to the same pay uh, same payoff. So you find the How same. So that's a great question. So if you just wait a little bit, you'll see techniques where we start to try to deal with the fact that you know we need to be more robust to uncertainty. Just one. Just so. Maybe you want to defer this too. It's kind of related, but I mean, and this, I realize this may be hard to answer empirically. But what's your sense for how much of what's important here is actually solving for a game theoretic equilibrium versus just introducing the uncertainty of randomness? That's a that's a really really great question. And the last ten minutes of my talk, I promise I'll I'll come to some of that. And I'm uh, now going to adopt uh, uh, Thomas's strategy and banish all questions and just continue on with my talk. Um, we have our support. Yes. <laughs> So the basic point here was that we feed this input into armor, and it quietly dies running out of memory because the game is so large. So we needed incremental strategy generation, column generation. Basically, the idea is to not enumerate all the 10 to the power 41 different defender strategies here. And uh, so I'm just going to very quickly, uh, uh, yesterday it seemed like, the day before it seemed like people were just saying column generation. Everybody understood what was going on. So that's what I'm going to say. So you start with a, a master program that just uh, has a few strategies and then master slave decomposition. Uh, you iterate. And finally, the global optimal you get, instead of having 10 to the power 41 strategies, uh, we may just have like a 500 row game matrix, so you may f find a global optimal without enumerating all the different defender strategies. And that's the way in which these games get solved. Um, we haven't solved the largest possible such games, but this has taken us a long way. And this is the way the IRIS program got built. It was delivered to the air marshals. 2009, they started deploying it. It uh, significantly changed the FAMS operation. If you've been on an international air flight, uh, by a U.S. air carrier, whether there was an air marshal on your flight or not, may have been determined by this program. In 2012, in a congressional subcommittee hearing, uh, again, they talked about our work, USC project with FAMS on randomizing flights, and so forth. So we were, uh, we were thrilled with this. Around the same time, though, you may recall or not, uh, there was an attack on Mumbai. Um, and so, you know, to last week when there was an attack in Paris, they said it's a Mumbai-style attack. Well, I grew up in Mumbai, and it's unfortunate that that's what Mumbai is known for now. Uh, but I grew up uh, maybe three blocks away from this hotel. And so uh, in one of my trips back, I saw uh, checkpoints being set up uh, by the police. And so these were supposed to be these randomized uh, checkpoints. And the question was, after coming back to USC, can we solve for the entire city of Mumbai to set up checkpoints on a randomized fashion using game theoretic principles? And so this was work we did with WINS. And uh, we could show that we can set up 15 checkpoints, 20,000 roads in a program in 20 minutes using a double oracle approach. So I was thrilled with this. We can solve generate randomized checkpoints. I went to the Mumbai police headquarters to present it. Uh, I felt like I was part of a Bollywood movie. Uh, but uh, it was really hard uh, because these people are not believers in uh, game theory at all. And so uh, it was really, really difficult questioning. But the dialogue continues. And so we will see where this goes. Next, uh, we started working with the US Coast Guard. And we developed this system called PROTECT. PROTECT is an acronym. This is just to tell you that we spend a lot of time coming up with uh, good acronyms. <laughs> so this was uh, start. Uh, this uh, first set of patrols was uh, implemented in Boston, taking into account weights of different targets. Can you generate patrols? What the Coast Guard were concerned about 
are threats like these, somebody uh, doing a suicide boat launch in the port. Uh, today, uh, Protect is deployed in uh, New York and Los Angeles and Houston, potentially going to other ports in the country. In 2012, after Boston was deployed and they saw our uh, progress, they made a small video. I'm going to play a small clip from the video uh, they made for us. The result was invigorated boat crews, more focused upon providing effective presence, reducing predictability, and enhancing the safety and security within our ports. Protect guided patrols became a source of pride for station Boston crews, and it doesn't get much better than that. Protect has also had other positive side effects, such as the development of better tactics, techniques, and procedures. The results have been exceptional. And, we can and so, um the other part of PROTECT besides sort of patrolling the ports is patrols around the Staten Island Ferry. Carrying 60,000 passengers a day, the Coast Guard think the threat is somebody launching a boat, uh, suicide boat into the ferry. So they run these patrols around the Staten Island Ferry. So these are actually our algorithms at work around the ferry. And so when uh, there's uh, appreciation uh, from the public about the Coast Guard patrols around the ferry, it, the Coast Guard uh, Tell us it's good for us, and uh, that, that's uh, that's uh, that's another system that's been implemented. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how this scale up works because it's slightly different from the column generation approach. And I'm going to talk to you in terms of uh, use of marginals here to scale up, and I'm going to use a discrete uh, state time represent space time representation. Although there's a continuous time version of it, Albert, uh, who's sitting here. Uh, is one of the principal architects of the system, so you can jump in. But essentially, uh, there's three locations, A, B, C, five, then three time points. So you can see a ferry here going from C to B to A, jumping from one point to another point. A red box uh, is any place where an attacker could attack the ferry. And so we can run patrols like the green patrol from B to C to B to try to protect this ferry. Uh, so if a patrol is near a ferry, it can protect it. So we can solve this problem just like we did before to generate a randomized patrol strategy over all the possible routes where we take the routes as variables. In this case, there are n to the power t variables. Because n is the number of locations, t is the number of time slices, so that's the total number of routes. Uh, this doesn't scale. But if we were to, instead of taking routes as variables, take uh, probability flows over segments. So take, for example, this green segment and the brown segment, combine it together in single probability flow variable. These two combine into a single probability flow variable. Now you have n squared multiplied by t uh, variables, far smaller number of variables. You can scale this up. You can get uh, the probabilities you want to run these patrols. So this is how the Staten Island Ferry uh, program was built. In 2013, we were, uh, again, fortunate uh, that the Coast Guard mentioned our work in the Congressional Subcommittee hearing. We're working with the University of Southern California to uh, utilize game theory as a way of optimizing and scheduling our patrol. So this is just so that people who appreciate game theory feel happy that game theory is being appreciated. So now uh, let's talk about handling of uncertainty. Here I talk about trains in Los Angeles. A barrier, we have a barrier-free train system, meaning people can get on and off the train without purchasing a ticket. So the LA Sheriff's Department does a randomized patrol check. Again, this is work done with Kevin and Thomas and others. And so uh, we first generated using our uh, Staten Island ferry type uh, X representation a schedule, which is written on paper. You know, that generates a uh, schedule to say, okay, 9.13 a.m., start checking people on the station for fair evasion. 9.23, get on the next train, start checking people for fair evasion. And on and on, uh, on it goes. Uh, the patrols are, the schedules are ready, patrols are ready. Our students go on with the officers to start the patrols. At 9.22, just before the train arrives, the officer says, I have to take a bathroom break. Now, uh, what do you do? I mean, we don't, we didn't provision for a bathroom break in our Stackelberg equilibrium. <laughs> so, but the more important uh, interruption happens when they arrest people, uh, when because it takes a lot of time to process people. So we needed to handle the fact that there is uncertainties in this process. So even though we want the probability flow of 0.3, there's a small chance that the uh, officer may remain at station B. And so this can be done by integrating MDPs into the uh, security game framework. So basically, each uh, pure strategy is MDP policy. And then you can load these policies onto smartphones, so there's always an action available to the officer, even if there is an interruption. 
Now, this is just one example of the kind of uncertainty we talked earlier about all kinds of uncertainties. The payoffs may not be exact. There may be interval uncertainty. How much surveillance is going on? How much execution uncertainty does exist? How much adversary rationality? I mean, you know, so there's all kinds of questions here. And uh, we've been working on these, uh, lots of theses being written with different algorithms that focus on all these different kinds of uncertainties. I'm not going to go uh, have time to go into all of this, but there's a lot of work uh, that's been focused on trying to build more robust algorithms that are robust to all these different kinds of uncertainties. But since I have limited time, let me move on to the latest topic that we've been working on, which is uh, green security games. This work started with the U.S. Coast Guard trying to protect the Gulf of Mexico uh, from illegal fishermen who come from across the border into the U.S. exclusive economic zone. So we've built this system, they've done these patrols, the software is with them, we'll see where it goes. Uh, with an NGO in Madagascar and our colleagues at Michigan State University, uh, we are working on forest protection uh, in, in that country. And so this is, again, trying to protect f forests from illegal loggers. With IBM India, the problem is uh, people who pollute rivers. For example, the Ganga River is a important river. Apparently, there's research going on uh, that says uh, if the river has some uh, intrinsic quality, so the water purifies itself and so forth. But unfortunately, that's not true. It's the fifth uh, dirtiest uh, river in the world. And it's because there's a lot of uh, people who pollute the factories. And so the question is, can we generate randomized inspections uh, of these factories? But uh, the part that I really want to focus on here today is work on wildlife uh, protection. This is Murchison Falls National Park, Uganda. We have a number of collaborators uh, around the world. This is the Wildlife Conservation Society. Some of you may have been in Uganda. I know Kevin has been there here. Um, but it's a, it's a gorgeous place, lots of absolutely wonderful animals. Uh, but there's threats to this wildlife. These are snares that poachers place. For example, this one here, the way it works is that they open it up, the jaws, put it into the ground. If an animal steps on it, it gets captured. Then a poacher comes and kills the animal. These are wire snares. There's thousands of these. This is just captured from 2014. And this is me with the head of security there uh, pointing to the loss that happens because of this. For example, elephants walking with their trunks cut off. So the way they try to uh, maintain security in these parks is that they'll go out, they'll send people out on patrol for some period of time. The patrollers will go out, collect data in terms of snares or human poaching signs and so forth. All of that will come back to headquarters, they'll analyze the data, and then send patrollers back again into the field. So we can look at it as a repeated uh, Stackelberg game. Here, for example, we've divided the forest area into grid. Each grid cell is a target. Targets with uh, more water are more important because there's more animals there. And now uh, the defender is generating, going to generate a mixed strategy. They're going to execute patrols. When poachers are attacked, we get data from which we can learn adversary models. And that will allow us to then improve our defender strategies. So we, we have a lot of data that we're getting from the field. For example, we have 12 years of data from Uganda. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But to speed up the process of getting data, we've also built this uh, system on AMT uh, for a game to have humans act as poachers and come attack uh, our algorithm. So here we've divided the park into a grid. The, if it's more green, it's not as well protected. People can attack it more easily. If it's more red, there's a lot more patrol, higher pro uh, patrol probability, and so a higher danger of being captured. We show hippos to show no, how important a cell is. We use hippos because it's a non-charismatic species, so people wouldn't feel as guilty uh, to poach. <laughs> and then we play, we generate uh, defender strategies, and we play games against them. Uh, this is, uh, they play for real money on AMT, of course. And um, so they can go to different parts and see uh, if they're successful, what they would get, if they fail, what they would get probability of success and failure. And then they can, if they succeed in snaring, they get real money. If they fail, they lose real money. So we've been playing these games now for several years, trying to collect data on how people act in these games. And what we notice, of course, is that, I mean, if we assume that people are acting uh, by calculating expected utility exactly, 10 more minutes, OK, good. Uh, it's not good, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no. 
so let me let me speed up. Well, we all know that the perfect rationality model it doesn't work. People just don't just attack one cell that has the highest expected utility. What we find is that a quantal response model, assuming that the adversaries are acting according to this quantal response model, meaning cells that have higher expected utility, they are more likely to attack. Cells that have lower expected utility, they are less likely to attack. And then calculating our defender strategies against that tends to work better. So you're not just learning. You're not just learning their strategy. You're actually trying to learn how they're going to respond to your strategy. That's right. That's right. So we are learning. In this case, we are learning this lambda for this model. And in in games that we've played, uh, this quantum response model. So this is just showing different four different games. Y-axis is defender expected reward. Lower is worse. Higher is better. And here, assuming perfect rationality leads to far worse uh, results than assuming that the adversaries are playing with the quantal response. But this was our first attempt. Uh, we found that there's a model that can e do even better than quantal response, and this we call subjective utility quantal response. Essentially, the idea is that people are taking the capture, uh, probability, reward, and penalty as three different features rather than combining them in any fashion. And then we learn the weights on these different features of different targets. And then if you look at the uh, use the quantum response formulation to calculate the subjective expected utility, and from that, the probability. That tends to work even better. And so this is not just in human subject experiments. If we match it with data from Uganda, this is for year 2012. This is an ROC curve. Uh, this corner going towards this corner is better. And it's showing that we can match with the SUQR model, get a better accuracy in predicting where poachers are attacking than with other competing models uh, from, uh, from our literature. We can do even better. So this is a paper that was submitted to AMAS last night uh, for uh, Uganda. So this is a system we've built uh, for Uganda, for Wildlife Conservation Society, showing that we can do continue to improve our model of how the adversaries behave based on real world data. So I'm going to uh, skip all of this in the interest of time. So there's a lot more, lots of very interesting phenomena. Uh, we found that. Uh, our model, in our data, human perception of probability is exactly the opposite of how Kahneman and Tversky find it in prospect theory. So theirs says people overweigh low probability and underweigh high probability. And we find people seem to not care about low probability and really care about slightly high probability. And so this is something very interesting. We submitted a paper to AIJ based on this. And the reviewers are not happy. They really want us to really, really, really show that this is true. So we will see. But all of this has led to a system called PAWS. Uh, this is for patrolling the forest for protection of wildlife. This was deployed in Uganda. Uh, this is uh, with uh, Andrew Lemieux doing these patrols. This was then uh, tried out in Malaysia uh, with Panthera. Uh, this is them finding a poacher's camp on one of the patrols. But the feedback was that, uh, you know, you guys are not paying attention to geography. And so they would keep telling us in Malaysia, the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line, which to us made no sense. And so we f all of us flew to Malaysia to see how that would work. So that's me, my student Faye, a former postdoc, Boan, uh, at the beginning of the patrol in the forest in Malaysia to see what is going on. So we were hacking our way through the forest, found a poacher's camp. At the end of uh, eight hours, that's our state, completely exhausted. But we did understand the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line in a forest. It's a ridge line. You have to walk along a ridge line to preserve energy. And so if you look at the forest in Google Maps here, you can see there's a hidden street map in the forest. If you walk along river streams and ridge lines, it works. So this is how we can generate patrol paths. So this is somewhat of sort of AI planning problem to find routes in this, uh, in this forest region. Use that to generate patrols, and that's what we now do. And so there is a pause system. People are out. They're out today in Malaysia in the forest patrolling, generating this output of pause. So uh, I'll skip this uh, crime model and get to the question that I wanted to answer in five minutes. OK. And so this is how do you evaluate these uh, systems? So our claim is that these security games lead to significant improvement over how humans were planning these sorts of activities for optimizing security resources. And we've shown this humans or other kinds of tools that were being used in the past. And we've shown this using evaluation in the lab, simulations, human adversaries. We've gone out in the field and measured patrol quality before and after 
Are our patrols more un, are our patrols more unpredictable? Do they cover the right kinds of targets? We've run scheduling computations, humans versus game theory. We've also gone out in the field and tried to catch the bad guys, if you will, to see who does a better job. And in, with all of these, we are able to show that the software, the security game based decision aid, leads to significant improvement over the state of the art, which is either human schedulers or simple tools that were being used. Now, I'm going to show you some very quick data in support of this. And the humans fail because it's just a very high cognitive load in these systems. And so I'm just going to show you some quick data. This is actual patrols from Boston done by human beings to try to patrol the port of Boston. This is days of the week. Y-axis is count how frequently was a target visited. So this is one particular target. How frequently was it visited over many weeks uh, on day one, day two, et cetera? There's two points to note here. First, there's very few patrols on day two of the week, a good day to attack the port. Secondly, all these lines crisscross, meaning sometimes the target is more important, sometimes it's no, no, not important. There is no systematic way to give weights to these targets. This is the patrols after protect. Less important targets are visited less frequently. More important targets are visited more frequently. There's no dip on day two, et cetera. And um, any, on any given day where the boat will go, unpredictable. But overall, the higher targets, important targets get visited more. If you look at it from a defender expected utility perspective, which we're familiar with, there's a 350% increase in defender expected utility from before to after. There's also a test that the FAMS ran six months, human versus our software, who does a better job scheduling? And there's all kinds of detailed uh, statistical tests. I've only seen it once in the more uh, high, you know, like a high security session where they showed me that data. Uh, but it's sitting there with them. But there's a GAO report if you want to see what are the weaknesses of human schedulers is a criticism of it. But it was after this six-month competition that they realized that the humans take a lot of time and do a worse job scheduling, and therefore the security games approach is better. Uh, we also ran a competition, humans versus game theory. Schedule 90 officers on trains in LA. These are pictures from that day. And we had neutral people who didn't know which schedule was which, trying to mark who did a better job scheduling. And there were 12 questions they were asked. Uh, and in the end, what we found is humans took a day to generate a schedule, and their schedule were marked worse than what we did. And so this is the red line, is the answers from the observers on patrol quality of our software versus uh, what was done by humans. Um, there's a mock attacker team deployed in Boston by the Coast Guard before to after. So these are like uh, people acting like terrorists, if you will, trying to say which was a better patrol. And their conclusion was that before to after protect, deterrence had improved. There are additional real world indicators from Boston. Voters questioning, has the Coast Guard recently acquired more boats? In fact, the number of hours of operation <laughs> has gone down, but uh, there was an appearance of more boats being on the water. We actually went and did a test uh, of game theory versus uh, random schedule. So this gets to my questions on uh, who, you know, who would do a better job uh, catching fair evaders. So officers for 21 days had to patrol. They didn't know which schedule was which. Once was using game theory, once was using uh, uh, pure random. And they had to go out. Now, this is a real test. These are real officers catching real people. And so our students were going along with them on every patrol. And so if the officer said, I don't like this schedule, I want to go somewhere else, there's no way for us to say, you cannot do that. No, not a student who's uh, sitting you know, with, the, with the LA Sheriff's Department. So he said, if you don't like it, if you want to go somewhere else, that's fine. And so in fact, what the, uh, in the 21 days of patrol, we kept the conditions as identical as possible. It turned out that whenever they were given a uniform random schedule, at some points they, they would say, well, I don't like this. I want to go to another place where I know there are more fair evaders and I can go catch them. So we let them do that, but this only happened whenever there was a uniform random schedule, they interrupted. Whenever there was a game theoretic schedule, they were happy with it. At the end of 21 days, if you look at the capture rate per 30 minutes, you will find that the game theory schedule led to a 60% improvement in, uh, in capture rate of fair evaders. This is a not controlled test at LAX. Um, this is before to after armor getting deployed and the arrest rate went up. But this is not a control test because there may have been uh, other kinds of things going on. So I know I should wrap up. Uh, this is me boasting, but in the interest of science, I hope you'll forgive me. I look at this as user feedback in terms of different commendations from the city and the Coast Guard and so forth that our group has received. So that's it. Uh, 
for us, uh, we feel that there is a tremendous amount of research yet to be done. So the answer to many of your questions, I can already tell you, research is yet to be done. Many theses have yet to be written for the sake of my PhD students who don't have a thesis topic yet. Yes, there is a lot of work. But uh, we are very happy to see all kinds of other applications. Our paper at AAAI 16 will talk about our work that's starting with the TSA to improve uh, screening at checkpoints. And so this is something uh, that may get implemented, so we'll see how this moves forward. But there's uh, audit games, uh, there's software testing, there's just uh, lots of exciting things to be learned. So I thank by ending my sponsors, uh, our Homeland Security Center, TSA, Army Research Office, and the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you. So I, I wanted to get your uh, maybe thoughts on, on the general approach of, of security. This is not, not a criticism of your work in general, but usually what we see when security fails is that attackers have somehow found a way to work outside of our model. Uh, for example, with checkpoints in LAX, they're not just driving a car bomb, but they'll maybe drive uh, a, a vehicle first to see if there's, a, if there's a roadblock and the car bomb will follow if uh, the first vehicle gets yes, yes, right? yes. So sometimes we, we, we might be worried about things going outside our model. Do, do you have any thoughts on how to improve models? So I guess the first uh, first uh, question, uh, first answer there is that we are not, I mean, we cannot provide 100% security. That's just not going to happen. And in fact, initially when we presented this work, people were saying, why don't you do a red team test? Send a red team, see if they can break through the checkpoints or not. And I would go and present it to Errol, and Errol said, this is nonsense. If you ask a dedicated group of people to go find a hole at LAX and go attack it, they will find it, no matter how much the security. That's not the question. The question is, have you increased the cost to the attacker so that they might now go to a lower value target for you? And if we ask that question, then I think there's an improvement there. Now, yes, if, so you know, if, if they have, instead of one truck, if they bring in six trucks, you know, that's it, we're done. But at least now we've increased their cost. So that's kind of the general uh, answer. In general, the way this whole thing has worked is that there's a human being who's doing this job. It's a boring job, it's a complicated job. If you imagine somebody scheduling for the air marshals, there's thousands of flights, there's duty hours, off hours, people have to be brought in, they go somewhere else, they have to be brought in. You can't leave an air marshal uh, outside the US. So all these complicated things, so they come up with a schedule. After all the scheduling is done, we say, you're not random enough, you need to be random. And it's very hard for a human being to do all that and the software is just better at it. Um, in a, uh, your talk, at least, you've taken the game matrix essentially as fixed, both in terms of the payoffs and the strategies. And I'm wondering if your uh, techniques here could inform about what types of things are easier to protect. So like if I wanted to expand my conservation in Africa, could I expand it in a way that would minimize poaching? So, so I guess uh, the way this works right now is that we go out, we patrol, we'll collect data. The idea is that that data will then allow us to improve our weights on the, on the different features of the game. That the, you uh, even implement different features. Like you could take a more mechanism design approach and change the game. You could, you could uh, do a better feature selection if your model is not somehow you know, getting a, a high, good enough prediction accuracy. You could try and figure out what might be going wrong. And, and there's all kinds of uh, other questions. But I guess at this point, uh, we are not working on dynamic uh, games and so forth. I mean, you know, there's work, uh, I don't know, Ariel Procaccia and so forth are looking at learning game matrices from scratch by playing different strategies and then uh, so forth. So that's also a uh, direction of work. We, uh, we haven't gone into that area yet. Let's take one more question. So just to uh, maybe take Michael's question forward a sure. little bit. Do you have anything yes. qualitative to say about, um, OK, so not pure randomization, but about the structure of your solution? So for example, your Boston solution, it kind of looked like you were covering in some proportion, and then you do that randomly. Right, right, right. right. So, 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 not to undercut the value of, of game theory here, but no, no. I, I think I think uh, this was exactly the question uh, Kevin asked me. Maybe you talked to him. Uh, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, this was exactly. So, I've been thinking about that, and we are uh, we are now trying to really try to uh, 
do further research on this topic. But the way to think about it is that in the end, we are trying to optimize against the, an adversary. So we're trying to see how can we optimize our limited resources against uh, an intelligent adversary. And so we need some kind of a model of the adversary. Now, all that, if you look at, once you, have, once you get into domains, urban crime, wildlife crime, there's tons of data available from which we learn the model. So that's the model that we are optimizing against. So that's, that's clear. The, when we come to things like uh, uh, protecting airports and ports, there isn't data. So we end up relying on expert knowledge in terms of how, what they think. And their general assessment is that these adversaries are very strategic. Uh, they are doing very careful surveillance. Errol has a whole chapter on the uh, kind of surveillance that gets done and how, you know, the planning cycle and the surveillance cycle. And so the idea is then that, yes, there is a significant amount of surveillance going on, and therefore uh, we have to optimize to, to, us, to an assumption that the adversaries are really very strategic. But obviously if they are not, and we, if we don't have any data, then what we want is a solution that is as robust as possible, even if they are not at that extreme scale. And so that's something that uh, we are uh, trying to do research on to see is there, you know, can we measure that? Can we see which of the algorithms have more tolerance to or less tolerance uh, to that? I mean, hopefully that gets to some of what Mike was answering. Let me stop there. Thank you.